Hi and welcome to Chess TV. In this week's opening school, Amelia and Alfred continue guiding you through the Ninja Indian defense. Chess games don't always run smoothly and sometimes there are some tough obstacles to overcome, something Alibet will tell you more about. As usual, I'll challenge you with a new chess puzzle and then on you once home will present the second part from our visit to the Nordic Museum. But first, the 25th Belgian International Open Championship, or also known as the Belgian Trophy, was concluded on December the 2nd when Dutch Grandmaster Spik Ansch edged the local Grandmaster Mildred Savage on better tiebreaks after both players finished with 7.5 points to claim the winner's trophy. This is Ansch's second title in Belgrade in 2011 as he also won the Summer Open. Congratulations! We'd also like to report that the Italian Championship is being played right now at the Hotel La Meridiana in Perugia and Fabiano Caruana is defending last year's title. And don't miss the CCSCSL Invitational that's being played in St. Louis right now. Read all about it at stlouischessclub.org. Here's the opening score with Amelia and Alfred. In this week's episode of The Opening School, we will continue analyzing the Nimzo Indian defense, which is introduced after d4, knight to f6, c4, e6, knight to c3, and bishop to b4. From here, we have analyzed the Rubenstein variation, which occurs after white's e3, and we have seen what happens after the moves b6 and c5. So today we'll take a look at the last of the three most popular continuation for black, namely castle kingside. This move is the most flexible of black's choices. Castle kingside is almost always a good move and it doesn't reveal black's plan and future development. White's answer against this move is very similar to the responses in the previously analyzed variations because white is here to play bishop to d3. Previously, white always had the possibility of playing knight g to e2 and the decision between the two moves, matter of choice, but that is not the case here. The difference lies within a combination of possibilities for black. This since black now still is able to retreat his, with his bishop to e7, since it isn't blocked by the move c5, and black is also able to play d5 without having to be afraid of leaving the queen's side too vulnerable since b6 hasn't yet been played. What this results in is that black can transpose the position to a queen's gambit decline after white's knight g to e2, after d5, a3, and bishop to e7. The result is here that white only has an awkwardly placed knight on e2, which would do much better on f3. So bishop to d3 is play played instead, it is a kind of stalling move allowing white to adapt later on to black's choice of play and keeping the possibility open for knight to move either to e2 or f3. Because after this last move from white, the possibility to play knight g to e2 is once again open since it won't block the bishop on f1. But it leads to a rather unclear position after first black's d5 followed by knight to e2 e5, d takes on e5, d takes on c4, bishop takes on c4, and queen an exchange on d1, where the king has to recapture since the knight on c3 was pinned, followed by black's knight to g4, winning the sacrifice pawn back. The position is unclear, but black has a small advantage, so white should try to avoid this continuation. Instead white, should, uh, instead, white should play knight to f3 after black's d5. This move is a little better since it's more active in the center and blocks black's e5, among others. Black's main move here is c5, but the strange looking knight on c6 isn't too bad. The plan is to advance in the center using the e pawn instead of the c pawn. But we won't look further into that, instead we will see what happens after black's c5 and white's castle kingside. 
This variation was the most popular variation in the entire Nims Indian for a very long time. And the reason for this is the wide vari variety of variations available for both white and black. Another reason behind its popularity is the fact that black is to play. And that means that it, in this very critical position is that black will have quite a lot to say regarding the future development of the game. A simple continuation in this position would be a, the double pawn exchange in the center, which would occur after first an exchange on d4, and then one exchange on c4. The plan is to create an isolated white pawn on d4, which can be used as a target to mobilize the black pieces and to open up for the white squared bishop, which will have quite a nice diagonal, and after black's b6. Important to recognize is the fact that this move also opens up for the white black squared bishop. In this position, there are lots of open flats and diagonals which white will have to take control over. And a good beginning is to use his bishop on c1 by placing it on g5, allowing for a future rook to c1. But black can also choose another variation if black believes the center to be too open by only capturing once in center and then by taking on c4 with the d-pawn. The plan is to keep the pawn on e3 blocking the, the black squared bishop, but still open up the diagonal for the black bishop on c8. The weakness with this move is revealed after white's a3. If black now would capture on d4, white wouldn't recapture, but instead take on b4, after which black would take on c3. White's exchange queens on d8, and then recaptures on c3. We have reached a position where white is considered to have the advantage because of the bishop pair, which can be very handy in this kind of endgame. One has to be aware of the white advantage, but it's far from deciding, and in order to use it successfully, one has to use the complex endgame. There are also, of course, many different variations for black and, of course, for white to choose between. But we will end this week's episode of The Opening School here, and we'll be back again next week, so see you then. Who hasn't had something funny happen to them while playing chess? Between me and my siblings, we got tons of stories, ranging from angry opponents acting out after a particularly difficult loss, to players being so into the game that they completely forgot about the world off the board and, to, and did the most bizarre things. I remember playing this one guy who had this odd, let's call it a secret weapon, for whenever his position would be less than favorable. You see, he had this wart on his finger, a really weird thing, and whenever he was in trouble on the board, He'd stare at you intently while discreetly rubbing his wart. Geez, I still get shudders whenever I think of it. But I'm happy to say that I did learn to ignore it and it made me a much stronger chess player. So thanks for that. Another time I was playing in this tournament and a cute little dog comes in with his owner. Dogs weren't really allowed into the tournament hall but this one was just so cute, you couldn't take your eyes off it. Then suddenly it started convulsing like crazy, shaking and coughing, and everyone's watching the dog at this point and wondering what's going on, except for its owner who seems to have been swallowed whole by the ground and vanished. This is going on for at least a minute until the dog just completely freezes and then throws up right next to my game. I thought I'd pass out. How is a guy supposed to focus on an, an important chess game while there's a demon-possessed dog puking right next to you? And then it just walks away, looking for its owner, no doubt. I'm telling you, playing chess is tough. But I guess my stories stack up pretty weakly, th though next to the ones printed in the latest issue of Chess Magazine's Top 10 Greatest Chess Tournament Mishaps. I won't spoil the fun for you, because it's definitely worth the read. But I can tell you there's fire, robberies, and a wooden leg involved. Read more about it at chess.co.uk.
This week we'll look at a new chess puzzle. It is white bat wins in two moves, so you have one minute to find the checkmate. Good luck. Puzzles like this one where the opponent's king is in the middle of the board, it often helps to first look on which squares the black king is prevented from going to. And what we see at once is that the only square the king can go to is e4. Well, the only problem is, however, that we don't have any piece that can guard that square and in the same time check the king without being captured. A move that at a first glance looks to be a good one is rook c1 takes on c6. If black responds with king e5, we can checkmate by playing rook to c5. But black has, of course, a better answer, which is playing the pawn to d3. With this move, black acquires more space and makes it impossible to checkmate him in just one move. To prevent black from playing d3, we must check in our first move. Rook c5 check gives us nothing after that the black rook captures our rook. We just lose an entire rook. Our other checking option is rook to d6 check. If black captures the rook with his rook, we get an entirely different position from the last one. We are in fact a rook poorer, but what we can do now is play rook to c5 checkmate. And let's see what happens if black chooses not to capture our rook but instead goes to e5 with the king. Rook c5 is now an not an option anymore of course, but so is instead rook to e1 checkmate. It is actually possible to solve this puzzle quite easily by, so to speak, cheating. It's actually not necessary to analyze the variations when you capture the black rook in the first move just because the moves are seem too easy. And in these chess puzzles, the solutions are supposed to be fairly hidden. It is therefore often a good idea to try more unusual moves, just like rook to d6 check was. But in order to get the most out of these chess puzzles, I recommend you to use your tactical thinking and imagine that your position has arisen in a real game. The whole idea with these chess puzzles is, is in fact to help you getting better at tactical finesses, which you always need in chess. And with this, I think it's time for Arne Wonson and some chess history, so here we go. Förra veckan så började vi titta på objekt i samlingarna på Nordiska museet och vi hittade en hel del med schackanknytning. Så vi ska gräva vidare idag så låt oss gå in igen och se om vi kan fortsätta våra efterforskningar på schacksamlingens område här. Jag tänkte som nästa tema ska vi väl kunna kallas schack med kunglig anknytning. Och här har vi några verkligt intressanta objekt. Och till att börja med så ska vi titta på de här pyttesmå schackpjäserna och några damspelsbrickor och ett tillhörande, en tillhörande ask som de är tänkta att förvara sig i. 
Så Karin, vad kan vi säga om de här små sakerna? Ja, de är ju tillverkade av kung Adolf Fredrik till hans fru. Jag kan läsa direkt här från vårt katalogkort där det står Egenhändigt konstarbete är förärad av konung Adolf Fredrik till dess gemål 1743. Och det består tydligen av 48 del delar i ben och trä. Mm. Adolf Fredrik var tydligen väldigt road av att arbeta med trä. Vi har även en del andra föremål i samlingarna som kommer från honom. Ett skrin och sen finns det ett par hyvlar och en svarv. Ja, det här med svarvning var ju högsta mode redan från 1600-talet och även populärt på 1700-talet. Och de här figurerna är ju mästerarbeten när man tittar närmare på dem. De är i storlek upp till två centimeter cirka höga och otroligt detaljerat arbetade. Och det är ju ett fantastiskt fynd att kunna visa det här egenhändigt tillverkade av Adolf Fredrik och Jacques Pieser. Och dessutom en koppling till Louise Ulrika som vi berättade om i förra veckans avsnitt. Där vi nämnde person, den ganska udda personen Badin eller Badin som ju ses på porträttet i, från Gripsholm. Som, där han sitter framför ett schackbred och håller en liten schackpjäs i handen. Min första spekulation där var möjligtvis om, om det var samma schackpjäser som han satt framför på det här bredet som, som då finns i porträttet. Men de är nog lite för små för det. Men det schackbredet han sitter framför ses på porträttet. Det här är en utskrift av porträttet och man kan tydligt se att schackbredet han sitter framför har röda och vita rutor med en bård omkring och eh, faktum är att vi nog har hittat det, just det schackbredet och eh, vi får väl ta och lyfta upp det här då kanske till och med. Baksidan ser ut så här där det står Drottningholm nummer tre på den sidan och då för att hantera det här försiktigt så ser vi att det just är de röda och vita rutorna och man kan jämföra storleken på rutorna med hans fingrar och det verkar då stämma tämligen perfekt med att det borde vara det här beredet och även borden omkring stämmer med porträttets det som återges på porträttet. Så det är ju ett fantastiskt fynd att vi från tavlan på Gripsholm har lyckats lokalisera det. Och det tillför ju en del till våra samlingar också att vi kan lägga till den uppgiften att det här finns porträtterat. Schackintresset då är ju jätteroligt att kunna visa att det är Lovisa Ulrika spelade schack och Adolf Fredrik verkar också ha gjort det och vi gör de här pjäserna som han egenhändigt har tillverkat nästan ännu mer intressant att en hel del av dem faktiskt är trasiga vilket innebär förmodligen att man då har använt dem dessutom så att det är ju gör det hela väldigt intressant extra intressant att se att det fanns ett aktivt schackintresse och spelande där och den fina asken är ju också värd att titta på. Så han måste uppenbarligen ha varit en skicklig hanterare av svarv och tresnideriverktyg. Det är intressant också att det var många kvinnor som spelade schack på mm. den tiden. Det var ju ett hovnöje bland damerna och det var nog fler damer vid den tiden som spelade schack än herrar förmodligen. Ja. Ja, vi har mer schackhistoria med kunglig anknytning. Mm. 
at londonchessclassic.com. You can follow the absolute super tournament live, the London Chess Classic. Our topic will return to in coming episodes, so don't miss it. Thanks for watching.